this is our four row strip till implement, just three point hitch. It's got adjustable row spacing. So like Mike mentioned, we did the corner there on 20s. The canola I'm about to talk about, we did on 15s and 12 inches. It works great. We got the residue managers, we have our discs, and then a little roller packer wheel on the back. Um, not much else to say about this, I think. If you want to take a look, take a look. What's the first uh, power requirement? Not a lot. <laughs> um, definitely, although it does need some good lifting power. We have had some issues with our John Deere over here running it. We couldn't get um, proper and even depth, but our other tractor it's been handled, handles it much better. Yep. I'm assuming so. Ken, you probably helped more with designing this than before I was the around. Sorry? The down pressure springs are really light. On the front disc yeah. there? Is that just, is that, that's for the whole row, is it not? No. You, you, are you looking at these little springs up front here? I'm just looking at the coulter springs. Okay. These up here. Yeah. So there's also springs oh, right here, right? Yeah. So there is a hole that does most of the work here. The coulter oh, is, yeah. is really just to kind of cut any residue and stuff that's in the way. We've also got residue managers here that will, will push that out of the way. And then there's a hole right here. So the hole does the majority of the ripping. Yeah. These two discs are basically to keep the soil from shooting out too far. And then these are actually the skinnier ones we, we had designed for our canola trials. But for corn, we tend to have the ones that are a little bit wider, about eight inches wide. So you create a nice little blackened furrow. Sometimes you can kind of adjust it. You can make a trough, you can make a hill. Yeah. But like um, Carlo and Mike had said earlier, probably the preferred practice is to do that in the fall. And then they say it's they freshen it up in the spring. So obviously guidance is pretty important for that. The freshening up piece, you do have to be careful. It's just about mellowing out the soil a little bit, getting a little bit of oxygen into there so that your, your seed to soil contact is good. You got good packing. And Mike also mentioned a good point, like especially in the clay soils here in Southern Alberta, we get really, really hard packed soil so depending on the type of spring we have so if we have no moisture in the spring often we've seen you know even when you think about a three inch spreader tip that's almost like a strip till machine as well so a lot of times when we have these dry conditions that type of tillage actually helps bring moisture up so in a lot of cases from year to year depending on where we're, the type of weather that we're having sometimes an air seeder with a hole will do better than a disc seeder and I think a lot of it has to do with this hard compaction, a little bit of tillage to helps bring up some moisture. So, you know, we, cut, we try to come up with like awesome data for you guys that you can just have a straight up recommendation. But um, on farm research and regular research, we might as well be weathermen, right? Like you, you know, that's, that's the sad thing, right? I hate to say it, but um, we can come up with sort of rules of thumb, but there's always a whole bunch of it depends. So if we have a year like we did this year, one of the driest years I've ever seen in my life, um, we definitely saw an advantage to a little bit of tillage. And that is counterintuitive when it's a dry year. But what it's doing is allowing that, that uh, capillary action to happen to bring the moisture from deeper up just to get good germination. Other, otherwise, we, we risk having soil trapped, or sorry, seed trapped in dry soil. So, so that's where sometimes this is also an advantage over a zero till precision planter is just helping bring that moisture up. And we also saw this year, anywhere that we had more compaction, we had better germination. So when I say compaction, I guess it's more like seed firming. Mm -hmm. so, so that again, changes from year to year. What this does, I think, is reduces that variability from year to year. So we're probably always gonna have a little more consistency in good, even germination than we would with zero till. So Ken, you're talking about bringing moisture up would be one of the benefits. What about the fact that with this, we also had a very, very cool spring, yep. dry, but so, with a lot of sunlight. So yes. By making it black, that yep. would have warmed it up a lot more there too than it would have been. Yeah, and I, I believe that that's an effect. We actually have used the soil temperature yep. probes. Mm -hmm. We don't see a huge difference in the data. But then I, I question the data in some regards because there's such big fluctuations in temperature from day to night. So as you have that soil black, warmed up in the sun it also cools off faster at night so that's the downside of it so i'm not totally convinced it's a temperature thing it could be but it, it could also be you know a frost effect too because when you're when you're closer to residue it actually tends to somehow bridge frost damage and, and i think you guys have seen that in 
in fields where you have lots of canola residue or, or wheat residue. It, it, wherever you have poor distribution of, of residue, yes, it'll trap moisture, but it'll also increase your risk of frost. Sorry, Carlo. So you just had my talk there, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so Let me get out of here. Back in on the same tracks and seed. Yeah, so when we do seed, we GPS is super important in that case. We need to make sure our row spacing is identical to the <clears throat> less than an inch, of course, similarity, and we need to line up and seed into the exact same rows. We have had issues with missing it over the years, but you know, better GPS, better steering columns, it's uh, improved. Let's uh, walk that way a little bit, though. Could you hang, so, the, uh, hang your seat outlet right here, too, just to drop the seat? Do this in the fall and then do the same machine in the spring with the seat attachment? No, no, this is, this is where we would have a fertilizer attachment. You still have to follow up with the seeder. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it is more... Ah, oh, it's still happening. It did show I difference. Like, I'm pretty sure there was a bit of a difference. Do you want to go Is back that, over here? Did we go too far? Yeah, we can go take a look at that later for okay. some plots here. Well, we'll start. Um, start off with a little quiz for you guys. Who over here can name the most grown cash crop in Alberta? Anybody? Canola. Canola, no. I'm sorry. It's actually wheat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What about the second grown, second most grown? Can you guess that one? Duro? No, that's canola. <laughs> second most grown crop in all of Alberta is canola. So, canola remains one of the most grown crops in all of Alberta and Saskatchewan. It's about 20 to 25% of all land seeded to canola in Alberta, and about 30% of all land in Saskatchewan seeded to canola. Yeah, quite a bit. The canola industry itself, contributes $27 billion to the Canadian economy every year. So with those numbers, I hope you see a little bit how much canola research is important. So at Farming Smarter, approximately every year, 20 to 25% of all of our trials are canola trials as well. These trials are anything from fertilizer to pesticide trials to different agronomy style trials. So, <clears throat> Canola was actually, or rapeseed was technically introduced to Canada by some Polish immigrants in 1936. They took it over and they grew it in their garden to make um, cooking oil. So that's where it came from. Over the years, Farming Smarter has done a lot of research in canola. We've done research in seeding rates, seeding dates, <coughs> fertilizer trials, we've done rotational studies, we've done row spacing, spray timings, cover cropping, you name it. Now we're in year two out of three for a strip till canola trial, which is the trial you see laid out behind me over here. So <clears throat> having proper residue management is tough. Mike mentioned that a little bit about corn as well. And as we are trying to move towards the zero tillage thoughts, it's tough for finding a proper seed bed for canola. For example, in our rotational study, we have found that Canola emergence is the worst on corn, which could be imagined, and it's the best on pea stubble. So conventional tillage has been shown to, sh shown to improve canola emergence. However, it comes with the cost of soil degradation, low organic and water contents in the soil, destruction of microbes, and of course, increased fuel, machinery, and labor costs. So due to those reasons, there has been a shift to conservation tillage. So high seedling emergence is important for canola. So this canola study is going to be testing the efficiency of management practices of strip tillage with different seeding implements for canola. We're looking at emergence, growth, and of course yield on both dry land and irrigation. So these are dry land plots we're looking at over here. And we also have this in three different locations across Southern Alberta. We have Lethbridge over here. We brought this up to Brooks and we're also out on Bow Island. So got that there, there we go. But why should you be interested in strip tillage? Mike already gave a good intro, but I got a couple questions that'll hopefully pique your interest in some strip tillage here. 
So question, do you want to avoid reseeding hilltops in your field? I hope, I hope everybody's not in. So every year I hear of way too many farmers that need to reseed hilltops just due to wind shear. The canola was there, you got a big windstorm coming through and all your seed is gone. Do you want to prevent heat blasting in your canola? Hope everyone's nodding with that one as well. So getting a little earlier flowering in your canola, you can avoid having your canola trying to put its full energy into flower in these hot days that we've been having recently. Do you want better and consistent germination for all of your canola? So canola's ideal germination is warmer than six degrees. Anything colder than that can slow or even stunt germination. Here's a big one. Do you want to save $10 an acre? Pretty sure everyone really wants that. So especially this year as cost of glyphosate went up, it costs around eight to $10 an acre just for a pass of glyphosate. Having one less herbicide pass can save you a lot of cash. Lastly, do you want all the benefits of tilling your land without actually tilling your land? So I haven't heard of a seed canola farmer who zero tills their canola. What if I told you there's a way of you to enjoy all the benefits of tillage without all the negatives I mentioned earlier? Well then, maybe I can convince you to think about strip tillage. So in this trial over here, we have four different seeding methods. We seeded with the precision planter, the same one we use for the corn. And then we seeded with that spreader opener that Ken mentioned earlier, that three inch hoe opener. We also have a narrow knife opener, which is about three quarter inch wide. It's absolute low disturbance. And then we have our disc hoe opener. Then we also have... I just want to make a clarification, Carlo. Yep. Uh, you made a comment about zero tilling, but I think you meant for seed production. Seed production okay. canola is more tilled. But yes. Did I say zero tillage? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, you said. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. All good, Ken. So we also have then the three different cultivation methods. We have conventional full tillage, and we have strip tillage, and we have no till. Where are we here? There we are. So, this trial we seeded at a rate of 80 seeds a meter squared. It was seeded on May the 12th, and we topped off for N to make sure that fertility would not be an issue for results. The canola was also seeded three quarter inches deep. We really want to try to hit that moisture, I think. So it was tough this year as a start, but we still got good emergence. So let's go over the, those questions I just mentioned earlier and I'll explain them a little bit. I asked, do you want to avoid reseeding your hilltops? So by strip tillage, you keep the stubble that you have between your seed rows, providing wind protection so you avoid all the wind shear in your field. It also provides better shelter, keeping them wetter. So we have had soil moisture probes installed in these plots as well to track soil moisture in the different cultivation methods. In all the strip tillage, we had approximately 4% higher volumetric water content compared to the full tilled plots. And this pattern stayed throughout the entire growing season. This was last year then. It stayed so the strip till plots always had a little higher moisture content than the full tilled plots. I asked, do you want to avoid heat blasting your canola? So heat blasting starts when temperatures rise above 28 degrees. Honestly, feels like we're already at 28 degrees. But this year on both dryland and irrigated, the strip till plots flowered a day earlier than the cultivated plots. The precision planted plots flower two days earlier than the non-precision planted plots. So if you're able to have earlier flowering canola, <clears throat> you might be able to avoid heat blasting and having aborted pods. Do you want better and consistent germination for your canola? So this year, across all three sites on dry land and irrigation, we had higher percentage emergence on the strip tilled compared to the no-tilled. In some cases, it was even very similar to the cultivated plots. This is largely due to the warmer temperatures of the soil in the strip till plots. Ken mentioned that there wasn't much of a temperature difference in, but there actually was, Ken, I'm sorry. There was, uh, overall. overall. Well, this year, the strip till plots stayed approximately three and a half degrees warmer than the fully tilled plots. The fully tilled plots did drop below zero in the spring. This was pre-seed. 
However, the strip tilt plots stayed above zero the entire time. So my thoughts there, if you manage to keep your soil warmer, you could seed earlier and maybe still have good results. So I asked, do you want to save $10 an acre? By having a quicker closed canopy, the weeds between the rows will hopefully be choked out. This year, at the time I was doing the pass, <clears throat> like the last pass of herbicide, the canola plots had a 5% greater canopy closure. The plots that were seeded with the precision planter had a 10% greater canopy closure, even though they were seeded on a wider rows. I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. The precision planted plots we seeded on 15 inch row spacing and the other three types we seeded on a 12 inch row spacing. So even though there was that wider row spacing for the precision planted, we did have greater canopy closure. This was mostly due to greater germination, more even plots. If you walk along, you could probably pick out your, the precision planted plots. I think I got two right behind me here. You got this one on this side. You can see it's a little wider. It's bushier as well compared to this one over here, which was spreader opener. Carl, so still... What, what, what's the row width on your strip tillage? Um, well, it would be the 15 inches on the plant, and of course we'd move to the 12 inches for the non-precision planted. Yeah. So, uh, I have some questions. Yep. Uh, what is the number of rows per plot? The number of which, sir? Of each plot. Like, the number of rows. Oh, that's all four rows. Like, yep. with four rows, okay. So, um, we did talk about germination, and... Um, few years ago, and even um, this year, we are experiencing um, poor stand establishment for some canola varieties. Yeah. So, um, can you um, give um, the preliminary data of um, the stand establishment of each of the treatments? And then, um, I basically prefer um, action than West. And I'm seeing um, you pull this. I don't know where this is coming from. and. Um, if I see this, I know this will be, give me more yield because looking at the number of pots yeah. per branch than this and then um, this. Unfortunately, there's no label for me to see this is treatment A, treatment B. Yeah. Can you um, educate me on that? Yeah, I was going to get to that in a bit here. It's, uh, as you can probably, you already probably noticed, I did lay it out in worse to better looks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, he basically, well, basically you're asking why I have these laid out here. So I'll get to that here. So if you take a look, these two plants over here, the first one was seeded with the spreader opener. This one was seeded with the precision planter. Both of these were seeded in no-tills. You take a look at the root development and the stem width. Keep that in mind. Let's move on to these two were strip-tilled plots. This one over here was the spreader opener. This one over here was a precision planter. Already by looking, I see greater root developments mm -hmm. and I see a lot wider stems as well. And then we move on to our cultivated, which is by far the best looking ones, right? We have extremely thicker stems. The root development is much greater. And as you mentioned as well, we got a lot more pods, a lot bushier as well. This was a precision planted. This was a spreader opener. But at the same time, I don't care how many pods there are for plant. I'm more concerned about how many pods. Exactly. Per it's, acre. yeah. The, yeah, no, you're right. It's, um, this one did just, it got more push. It gets pushier in that way, right? Yeah, so there's more, there is a greater row spacing as well. So when we do do our yield, we will take into account that there is the different row spacing. Well, yeah, 100%. So, whoa. Let's take a look at some yield results from last year. Last year was an exceptionally dry year. Our dry land, we had pretty poor results. This year is going to be a lot greater. Oh, there we go. Um, so last year we had just about four inches of rain. We had to add two inches of emergency irrigation along the July 1st weekend, just so we would get a crop off. The strip till canola yielded just as much as the cultivated. So this might not seem very useful, but then again, the harsh conditions, it, and it was not, everything was so low, it's hard to get any real and consistent data. However, throughout the year, it still did have the higher moisture in the dry land plots. So I also want to point out the advantage of the planter. Um, I did already talk about this over here, so you can see 
it provided the greater canopy cover. It was the bushier rose as well. And yeah, I went over that. So the spreader opener is also providing better results. So Ken mentioned a little bit, the spreader opener itself is kind of that strip tiller. It does have a little, it's that three inch spreader tip. It provides a much better seed bed for the canola compared to the narrow knife. For example, the narrow knife on a no-till plot is absolute lowest disturbance you can get. The spreader opener on the no-till plots is higher soil disturbance, makes a little better seed bed, made a little better results. Then again, you have the spreader opener on let's say the fully cultivated plots. That's highest disturbance. First you disturb all the soil with cultivation and then you re-disturb that your whole seed row with seeding. Cultivation in the narrow knife still did decently well, but it's a little less disturbance at seeding time. So did you do any comparison of the seeding rates to actually plant populations by, by, by treatment? We, no, it was all even seeding rates. Is yeah, that, was it, but did you actually count if you had the same number emerged, the same number of plants? Yes, so we did do emergence counts as well. Um, precision planted stuff definitely had highest emergence. It did make for those more even, more consistent rows. The spreader opener, I believe, was second. And then the narrow knife and disc hoe were toss-ups. Yep. And this was even across all three sites, all both irrigation or dry land. There was no difference. The planter came out ahead and the spreader followed. Yep. And then you said for the, in terms of the methods, the cultivated strip till and then um, no-till for the Yeah, so emergence? the cultivated was a little better than the strip-tilled, but the strip-till outperformed the no-till by a long shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I already, we already looked at strip-tiller. I mentioned GPS lines up. That's really your most important thing if you're strip-tilling your crops. You want to make sure your GPS is lined up and your rows are seeding right into your strip-tilled rows. Otherwise, there's no point in strip-tilling. So, then... Let's take a quick up a look over here. So these are the two you were pointing out before? Yes, so these are both no-tails. That was a precision planted plot. This was a spreader tip plot. And then... So this one's like the flowering, it's still starting to flower like it's later by a couple days, obviously. Yes, the no-tails, well the planter was earlier flower than the spreader tip. And then I think we got the disc hoe over here. Where you can see is even, I can see worse stand. Yeah. I see gaps over here, items. difference. It looks not as even and consistent as a spreader tip. And then I think we move on to some strip tilled plots. All of those are yeah, so those first three are no tail. We can compare it to some strip tail plots. I see overall better emergence, yeah, better more stand. More better, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So in that case, they're still easy to pick out. It's throughout the whole season, I would be able to stand in front and especially at emergence time, around the two to four leaf stage, it was super easy for me to pick out which plots for which. I could pick out treatments one by one. Now can we do that with come harvest time for yield? Come, I sure hope we can. <laughs> the monitors, yeah. I'm sure, will, that's all that yeah. really matters. That's all that matters, yes, in the end. So I mentioned this is year two out of three. We have three sites this year. Hopefully we get a lot more yield data and we'll get some better results than we did last year, or more not better, I should say more valuable results. Higher, higher, yield data. higher yielding data, yes, that's yeah. a big one. Um, yeah. Any questions? Was that branches per pod, and remember we did like yeah, uh, so seeds per pod? Pods per branch, yeah. branches per stem, whatever. All we that. did some crazy data last yeah, year as well. We went through, collected five or ten plants of each plot. We spent, our students spent a lot of time on this. We counted how many branches were off the main stem on each plant. Then we counted how many pods were on the entire plant. And then we got ten pods and we counted how many seeds were in each pod. There was not much, there was no difference for seeding methods on this. And there were slight differences on different cultivation methods. However, the standard deviation was so large, it, was, it did not give consistent data. Maybe this year when we do that again, we'll get some different results, but we'll see. Looks like it based on the, yeah, on the table. Yeah, I think we will, especially the planted stuff, precision yeah. planted, yeah. So I wanna thank, personally thank Carlo, cause he's, um, well, he's been here for a while, started off as a summer student, but he's now with a, a permanent position 
and it's a good time to highlight the uh, partnership with uh, Lethbridge College. So this trial is actually funded through an NCERT grant to the ARDs on the signs that stands for Agricultural Research and Development. Research and Development. But um, so it's a it's a partnership with the college. We're actually working with them to access federal research grants to to do this innovative work. It is stemming from previous work done that was recently published by, by Dr. Gerbeer, so it's now published in the Canadian Journal of Plant Science, where we just looked at using planters in canola. So that study was really interesting. Basically, you know, what we learned from that is you can do a really good job with canola using a planter. You're never gonna see sort of a reduction in yield, even with the wider row spacings. Our, our, for the most part, we did see that the wider rows, like the 2022s, we're just a little bit too wide. So that's typically what, what folks are using around here. Even if you can get to a 15, that's why we chose the 15 inch row spacing because the equipment manufacturers are now sort of targeting a 15 inch row on their equipment. John Deere owns Monosem, so they've got a planter now adapted to, to small grains in Western Canada. There are some interesting planters that will have a 30 inch row spacing and then an extra opener that will drop down so that you can do either 30 or 15s but still work to be done. We did find under high yielding environments, especially under irrigation, we're seeing upwards of 20% yield advantage. Whereas when water is limiting, it's, it, it often doesn't show a difference. Overall emergence is way better with the planters. It's always, always better than, than um, air drills. Of course, there's so many different drills. This isn't a comparison of one drill versus another. It's just looking at different types of seeding systems and how they work. So we've seen a lot of advantage to these, um, these planters. There's, there's lots of work to be done to adapt them to our, our systems. This idea of strip tillage in canola is really sort of targeting those high yielding environments. So when you have lots of straw, Mike and I have been doing plots forever and we're always seeing crappy emergence behind the combine, even with good spreaders. So I still think as far as emergence and establishments uh, going on, we still need to figure out how to deal with all the residue, especially in good years like this. We're going to have lots of straw. How do we manage that straw and how do we seed into it next year? Strip tillage might be an opportunity to deal with those types of years where you have huge trash issues without having to go to a tillage. Um, the other side of it is it's also a conservation practice for our irrigated acres and our seed canola. Not only are we um, looking at advantages for, for performance and yield, but we're looking at saving the crop because how many people have to reseed their canola because of sandblasting or wind blasting? You know, basically it gets so windy that, that it just chews off the little canolas and they have to reseed. This year we saw a fair bit of seed canola reseeded. So this, even the seed companies are now starting to pay attention to this technology. So anyways, I want to thank Carlo and uh, I think we're heading off for a break now. Are we loading up and going back, Jamie? Yeah. Yeah, one, one funny point Ken mentioned about that is like oftentimes you'll see we've got these nice winter wheat pathways we put into grass here. And when we get that dry weather, we've seen where our plot emergence is garbage and our emergence in this winter wheat because it's all been seeded over after after planting is actually really good and the plants will be up here and nice and vigorous because they've kind of been worked through and the plots themselves look pretty poor so it's it's pretty interesting when that happens and that happened a few times this year